I will first welcome everyone to Simply Living, hosting Mort Schmidt in part two of Ohio Broadleaf Leaves and Trees today. And I want to do a special thanks this time. I didn't do it last time for Rita Hayter, who has brought us Mort and through a previous relationship. And she often goes to his tree talks, which we've talked about. And some of you know about this already, but he does uh, has a list of people who want to occasionally join him and taking walks in various wooded areas around Columbus and uh, hear <laughs> firsthand his comments about uh, uh, the trees. And he has a, a wealth of knowledge and I will let Mort introduce himself now. And I think most of you know, it doesn't have to be a long introduction. He is a fount of information and he is a, uh, a great guru to have to learn from. Go ahead, Mort. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Rita, for making all this, uh, for arranging all this and making it all possible. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And most of you, I understand, I believe we're here last week when we went through the basics of tree identification. So I'll just reiterate that very briefly. If you're interested in walking, I usually have walks Thursday morning and Friday after one on Friday afternoon, mostly the Franklin County Metro Parks. We also get over to Delaware. Dublin has a few, et cetera. And you can contact me at Mort Schmidt, M-O-R-T-S-C-H-M-I-D-T at yahoo.com if you'd like me to add, if you'd like me to add you to the list. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Have we shared the screen? Yeah. Oh, we have not shared, have the, shared screen. the screen. Are we do you see our screen, Chuck? Well, I'm not hearing him. Ah. Chuck, can you see this? Did you hear what I said? Here we go. Okay, sorry about that. So, <clears throat> can I move this so that I can see? I can't see the entire, I don't need to see myself. There we go, great, perfect. Okay, so we're going to go through, it'll be kind of brisk. I'll stop a time or two in the middle or um, for questions. People can ask questions as they go along, but I won't necessarily hear them all. And I'm not watching the chat. I've got, I'm, I'm not a good multitasker. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to talk for a while and then take breaks for questions here and there. So. You'll recall from last week, we've got several ways that leaves and branches can be attached to trees. There's alternate, but we're going to go through them in the same table. Chuck sent you copies of a table where I've got 50 trees. That's the order in which we're going to go through them. And on that table, I've got numbered trees. And I have just the, I have the common name and the Latin name, which might make it a little easier to look up if you want to do that. And I have just enough information on here that you could probably identify the trees pretty closely. I'm not going into all the data, but I'll also throw out some uh, interesting lore and facts and uses about trees, just so it's not too dry. All right, so from last week, you may recall, we have alternate, which is the upper leaf, the upper uh, icon on the left, and the upper right icon is opposite. The leaves and the branches either are staggered one above, above the other or they're directly across from each other, alternate and opposite. Leaves are either compound or they're simple. If they're simple, the leaves are attached directly to a permanent part of the tree, a twig, a branch, a trunk. If they are compound, they share a stem and that the leaflets and the stem all fall off together at the end of the year. There's doubly compound in the middle lower picture is doubly compound where leaflets are attached to stems. Those are attached to bigger stems. In that case, the middle lower figure, 35 leaflets all on one big compound leaf. Bottom right, palmately compound. Left is pinnately compound on the lower right is palmately compound like the palm of your hand and the way the fingers are attached to your wrist. That's palmate versus pinnate on the lower left. Oh, so there we go. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to go first through alternate 
leaves with alternate simple uniform lobes. And that's most of the trees in Ohio. That is all of the first page of that table I gave you. And all the others are on the other side, the second page, which is a little, little more than half that size. Two fingers, okay, let's see. There we go. So the first group I'll talk about is, well, probably the most important group of Ohio trees and maybe overall the most important group of hardwoods in the country and that's oaks. You probably associate oaks with these leaves on the right that it has lobes on it. Most, but not all of the oak leaves look like that. What's really critical, you'll remember from last week that it is the fruit and the flowers that are used to define a species or a family, a genus, whatever. It is the fruit that is most critical to classification. The leaves are handy for identification. But what makes an oak tree an oak what makes an oak tree an oak is that it has acorns. If it has acorns, it's an oak. The leaves are leaves are usually lobed, not a hundred percent though. They are pinnately veined. You can see those leaves on the right. There's one central vein running down the length of the leaf, and then secondary veins coming off at various points. So that's palmately veined, just as palmate leaves, palmately compound leaves, have leaflets attached at different points on the stem. Another trait of oaks in general is that they have multiple terminal buds. This is a real good winter identification trait. If you look at the end of the twigs in the winter, the, the buds on the end, the terminal buds are usually clustered on the oaks. The leaves are typically persistent. The oaks and the beeches, which is in the same family as the oaks, tend to have persistent leaves. So if you see a lot of leaves left on a tree in the winter, while most of the others have fallen, there's a good bet that it's an oak tree. In terms of the wood, an interesting thing about the tree and something you can see in the stumps and broken branches, oaks have, they, they have ring porous lumber. You can see that wood, this is the end section. If you look at the end of a board on the, that picture on the right, you'll see that the larger pores are lined up in rings. Some of the trees are ring porous, that would be ash, oak, and hickory. Some have the larger pores spread evenly through the wood, that would be like maple, sycamore, and some are in between. They have, they, they have the pores lined up and then they cut uh, along the rings and then as you get farther from the ring, they're kind of spread out, that's semi-diffuse. But the ash oaks and hickories are ring porous and because of that, the wood splits along the grain very well. And that can be very useful if you're making a tool handle. You know, the settlers didn't want to have to saw all of their wood. And so they would split out lumber if they could. Uh, it was a whole lot less work and the woods with like oak that has the ring porosity, they split very readily. It's also very good if you're breaking up your firewood into chunks, you sure wouldn't want to have to slice it and cut it into pieces with a saw. So this is one of the splitting woods. There are two groups of oaks. The first is the white oak group. And again, the difference is not the leaves. What people usually know about the oaks, if they can separate the white oak group from the red oak group, is that the white oak leaves have rounded tips whereas the red oak leaves have pointed tips. And you can remember that the snowball is white and it, it is rounded. So if you see rounded tips, you might think of white oak as opposed to pointed tips for red oak. I'll show those in a minute, a few minutes. <clears throat> but in terms of the actual botanical classification, what's important about the white oaks is that the acorns mature in a single year. The buds are usually rounded. Those terminal buds I show you in that lower picture, same I showed you earlier, they're very rounded. Whereas the red oak buds are typically pointed. The distinction's not always obvious, but you can usually narrow it down that way. The most recognizable feature to me in the winter, or if the leaves are up too high to see, is that the bark on most of the white oaks in Ohio is scaly, like that photo on the right. And that's one of the reasons I like I like uh, bark as an identification feature is because you can see it any time of year. You can see it on logging trucks, on the back of a logging truck or what have you. 
Uh, if the leaves are up too high, you can usually always tell a red oak from a white oak by the bark, but it is the acorn that defines it. So when you say white oak, you have to be careful, or if someone else says it, you have to be careful you, that you understand this is both a group name and a species name. White oak, the species white oak, is the flagship of the white oak group. There are a number of oaks in the white oak, several common in Ohio, I'll show you, but they all have acorns that mature in a single year. Uh, this is the white oak. This is the flagship of the white oak group, and it has the rounded tips, as you say, on the leaves. The lobes are intermediate length there. The lobes are more than half the width, at least half, or sometimes more than half the width of the leaf. And those are very classic white oak, species white oak of the white oak group on the left. On the right is a beautiful example of the classical scaly overlapping bark. Many of you, most of you probably know shag bark hickory. You might mistake it for shag bark, but shag bark strips of bark pull up at the top and bottom. This is overlapping on the edges. And when you get an eye for that, it becomes a lot more obvious. But I suggest learning bark by looking at the leaves in the summer, pay attention to the bark, and then when the leaves come off, you'll get a feel for it. It becomes very obvious when you've looked at it for a while, but describing it, not seeing it in the field, it's not so obvious. This is my particular favorite tree, the white oak, because this is what we age wine and whiskey in. That's what the barrels are made of. The, both of the oaks, both of the oak groups have these large pores, but the white oak has tylosis. They're like little bubbly foam-like structures. If you look with a magnifying glass, you might be able to see it. The pores in the white oak lumber have these have these tyloses that keep liquid from leaking out. And so if you were to put wine or whiskey or back in the day water in a red oak barrel, it would leak out in a matter of days. If you put it in a white oak barrel, it'll stay in there for months, years, whatever. And uh, so that's why white oak is used for barrels. That's tight cooperage. Both of the oaks were good for making barrels because you could split out a long stave and then smooth it down with a plane and you'd, you'd make your barrel staves that way. They were both made good barrels, but they used to use red oak and some other woods for like crackers and flour and nails and all these things that they hauled in barrels. But for liquids, you would go with the, with the white oak. And that wood, that piece of furniture behind the wine bottle I show in this picture, that is classic white oak stained. You can see the light colored streaks on it. Those are the rays. I won't go into great detail, but the, all of the hardwoods have rays, but they're largest and most distinctive in the white oak. And that's classical furniture from early in the century is the white oak, shows those long rays. Very similar lumber, also very high quality lumber is the bur oak. It gets its name because the acorn cap has these kind of frilly things on it. The leaf is very distinctive. The leaf of the bur oak looks something like a fiddle. It's got the, the half closest to the stem, has these long skinny lobes, a lot like the white oak, but then the, the end at the tip, the other half of the leaf has very shallow sinuses in between the lobes and it's, it's more solid. So you've got a mix of long lobes and hardly any lobes. That's the bur oak. Very similar in most respects to the white oak. Chinkapin oak, also in the white oak group, its acorns mature in one year. The white oaks have the sweetest acorns of the, of the uh, oaks. The red oaks are more sour. They have more tannic acid and so the sweet, oak, sweet acorns of the white oaks are more popular among squirrels and chipmunks, blue jays, whatever. Even people, the Native Americans, ate the chinkapin oaks. I don't know exactly how much preparation it required. I've read sometimes it required no preparation, but at least some of the white oaks, the natives would soak the acorns in water for days or weeks. They'd put them in baskets and then submerge it in a river or in a, a container of some sort of water and that would leach out the tannic acid and then they would convert the acorns into uh, 
a paste to make a bread or a pudding or something out of. Some of the California oaks were so sweet that they were eaten with no preparation. That might or might not be true of chinkapin, but it was consumed by people and it was the sweetest of the, of the acorns and even the sweetest of the white oak acorns. The leaf is characterized by this long, longer than, than uh, wide leaf, but it's got very shallow sinuses and very short lobes. Swamp white oak, not as good a quality as the name suggests, not as good a quality lumber, uh, not as dense, but as the name suggests, it likes living in water. It usually is living near or sometimes even in standing water, at least part of the year. Leaves are very distinctive because they're, they're very wide. They're wider near the tip than they are at the stem end. Very shallow sinuses, short lobe, same thing. Another very distinctive feature when you're walking along the woods and you see leaves that look the same, but one is distinctly lighter than the other, like there in the lower left, that could well be because you're looking at a swamp white oak. The Latin name is Quercus, that's oak, Quercus bicolor because of the distinct difference in the leaves from top to bottom. And that's true in the winter when it's brown and in the summer when it's green. Okay, now the group red oaks. Again, the leaves typically are pointed. That's a good recognition feature. The buds there you see on the right, those buds are distinctly more pointed than the white oak buds you saw earlier. You can often tell a difference on that basis. The bark is distinctly different. It doesn't look like overlapping plates. You see these long ridges, long smooth ridges with shallow furrows in between. So you can think of ridges red, that's the red oak with those long smooth ridges. But again, from a botanical standpoint, the distinction is that the acorns mature over two years and they're higher in tannic acid. They're not as edible to animals or certainly to people as the white oaks. As is the case with the white oak group, there is a species called red oak in the red oak group, or sometimes it's called northern red oak, but often just plain red oak. Very common in central Ohio. You can see the leaves there on the left. There's a, an acorn cup left from the previous year. Always a good feature to look for. There's often at least one or two cups left on an oak tree, even if all the leaves are down. But the red oak, the northern red oak has shallow sinuses, relatively shallow sinuses. The lobes are maybe, the length of the lobes is maybe half the width of the leaf. It has the largest acorn of any Ohio oak. Pin oak is the other really common red oak I see in this area. And you can see the leaf on the left. If you remember the exercise we did last week where we went to the Missouri website and the OPLIN, the Opland website for Ohio and identified a tree, that was the same leaf. It's got very skinny, long lobes, deep sinuses. But what's really distinctive about the pin oak is its branching habit. This is another freeway tree. You can spot this guy when you're driving along in the winter and it has no leaves because of its shape. You'll notice the upper branches rise, the horizontal branches, the middle branches are horizontal and the lower branches are sagging. In the middle of the forest, sometimes the lower branches start to drop off. It prunes itself, it may not be as obvious, but that if it's out in the open, et cetera, and it's not competing, they tend to hold on to the branches. That hourglass shape is very characteristic of pin oak. Pin oak is the hardest of the red oaks. In general, the whites are harder, but the pin oak is the hardest of the red oaks. And it is not the most high, it's not the highest quality oak lumber because it tends to have a lot of knots in it. But if you cut out the smaller pieces in between the knots, you've got some very hard pieces of wood. And you know, we haven't always had nails and nails used to be extremely costly. When a building got too old, the pioneers would burn it down and then when it cooled off, they'd go collect the nails for use again because metal was so precious, even iron. But they did hold buildings together with pins, with dowels. And the pin oak was a popular choice because in between those knots was a very hard wood. So that's where it gets its name, pin oak water tolerant, often standing in, in or near uh, vernal ponds, ponds that are uh, dry part of the year, standing water part of the year, and of course along rivers and like, but they do reasonably well in upland areas too. I have this in 
on my table along with the other lobed leaves, but this is the one native Ohio oak tree that is not lobed. This is the shingle oak. It's called shingle oak because it's split beautifully and they, the pioneers would split out shingles with an ax. You'll notice the leaves there, on, well, in both pictures are quite a bit longer than they are wide. They get up to maybe four or five inches long. They usually have a smooth margin. They would call that entire. They have entire margins, but they can have small saw teeth in the, when they're uh, young. But good bet if you're seeing that, and it's certainly if it's a native, it's a shingle oak if it has the lobes. You can see on that right picture, the winter picture, there's a little bit of an acorn cap there. So I know that that's an oak, even though it doesn't have the characteristic lobes that you would see on other oak leaves. Okay, so that covers the oaks, but we have a lot more alternate, simple, uniform lobed leaves. I meant to mention earlier, I've got an icon in the upper left of this picture, and I have an icon on all of the trees that shows what their general characteristic is. In this case, alternate, and I'm not showing a compound leaf of any sort. This is alternate simple. And these ones have uniform lobes. So, sweet gum. The leaf looks like a star. It's got five distinct lobes on the left. One of the most obvious features any time of year of the sweet gum is this starry ball fruit. It's about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half in diameter. You wouldn't want to step on it barefoot. But these are very persistent, which means that it's on the tree for most of the year on into the winter. And I'll typically see sweet gum trees are still holding on to some of these spiny balls in the spring and the early summer when they start putting out new green fruits. So you can spot these just about typically any time of year on most of the trees I've seen to identify the sweet gum tree. But the leaves are very characteristic too. That would be an example of palmate veining where the leaves in the sweet gum all radiate out from a single point or the primary veins. In this case, five primary veins radiate out from a single point, just like the fingers on your hand, palmate veining. Similar in its general plan and the general leaf shape, this is alternate simple uniform and that's sycamore. The leaf there on the left, you'll see the three primary veins radiate out from a single point, similar to the, to the palm of your hand. The fruits, the upper right, are about the same size as a sweet gum, but they're not spiny. That's not too hard to see on the tree. And you'll usually find some fruits, especially the sweet gum, you'll usually find fruits underneath the tree, as long as you're careful that they didn't come in from somewhere else. The most distinctive feature of the sycamore is this camouflage looking bark. So remember, camo is in sycamore. You'll always see on a, an, at least a several inch in diameter mature tree, you'll see this camo bark. Now I have to caution you one thing with bark is it doesn't come off in the winter. So that's, that's an advantage when you're trying to identify it on the basis of bark but you do have to watch for the maturity of the tree. Sometimes the bark is different on a juvenile tree than it is a mature tree. And in a mature tree, you'll see lots of the brown scaly stuff on the lower part. But if you look up in the tree 10 or 15 feet, you'll see this camo, camouflage looking bark. And still higher, you'll see silvery bark with very, very little of the brown scaling on it. Good identification feature for sycamore also I found on saplings before they develop the characteristic bark is they have these stipules on them. All of the hardwood leaves have stipules, <coughs> excuse me, around the base or on the stem uh, where the stem attaches to the twig. A stipule is a sort of modified leaf and they serve different purposes. Sometimes we don't know exactly what they do. In this case, the stipule photosynthesizes. It's pretty much like a leaf, but it's not attached by a stem. It looks like it's wrapped around the twig. So if you see a sapling with a, several of these on it, there's a good bet that it's sycamore. Sycamore loves water it, and it is the largest tree in Eastern North America in terms of overall score, the combination of the height, the diameter of the trunk and the diameter of the crown, so the scoring factor together make it the largest Eastern uh, tree. They can be six feet or more in diameter, the trunk and people used to live in them. They tend to hollow out. Most of the wood that is light in color tends to be 
tends not to be rot resistant. Darker woods tend to be more rot resistant. And so you'd find that sometimes trees were hollowed out. People would hide in them or camp in them while they were out hunting. And uh, people would even live in them while they were building their cabins. So they can be huge, a very interesting tree. Limited lumber value, it's a high quality lumber, uh, very hard. It's got a pretty pattern if you cut it in the right direction, but it isn't used a whole lot because of its tendency to hollow. There's may not be a lot of lumber to work with. You can't split it to save your life. It's not good firewood, although it would burn pretty hard, pretty well and pretty hot. And uh, uh, it, it tends to be kind of hard to access because it likes water and it's often growing along a stream where it's hard to access. But you'll find it in upland areas too, especially around here where we have clay soils and rather poor drainage. It's by no means limited to riversides, but it's common along creeks. Similar general plan, you see the alternate simple uniform lobes. Again, this one is palmately veined. You can see the leaf there on the left. This is the so-called tulip tree. It's often called tulip poplar, or at the lumber yard, it's even just plain called poplar, but it is not related to the poplar. The common names are often pretty quirky. Somebody thought that the lumber resembled a lumber of poplar. They're both rather soft, but uh, it is not botanically related. But the tulip, the tulip in the tulip tree name is very obvious. You can see why. This picture, the second one there, the middle picture, that is its summer flower. They come out after the leaves are, in, are out. And so you may not notice it. It may be not terribly obvious. It's kind of a yellow subdued color, but they're really very pretty. Once you've seen them, you'll recognize them. And uh, you've got this characteristic little yellow coloring around the base of the flower. They, the flower is a stem, I'm sorry, it's a cone starting out and then it turns into this flower-like structure. And then in the winter, it has an open cup. They look like little tulips. You might only find two or three on a tree, but you'll usually find a few if you're looking for them. So that's a good way to recognize it. Bark to me is not terribly diagnostic, except for when it's middle age, but I usually go by these cups when I'm trying to identify it in the winter. But what's really distinctive about the leaf is if you look at that leaf on the left, and the one in front of the flower, it's different in that it doesn't have a point on the end. It's got a notch in the end. Usually it has four lobes. Sometimes it's got some smaller lobes around the close to the stem, but it doesn't have a point at the end. It has a notch, very unusual leaf shape. The only thing like it in this part of the world. Okay, so we're still in alternate simple leaves and will be for a while. And uh, I'll go to variable lobes now. Chuck, this might be a good chance for if people have questions, if they've brought them in, this would be a good time to ask. And, uh, any, any questions here? You can raise your hand or you can uh, just unmute and ask your question. I, I, I have a question about the, the ding that happens. Is that on your computer, Rita? Yes, it is. And I thought I turned my email off so it wouldn't okay. do that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it has a lot of friends. <laughs> I, I get dings on my text, but not my not the other. I, if, not, <clears throat> if you if for for the rest of you, if you click on the uh, chat, and then at the bottom you can type in any questions you have. Uh, I will just comment that uh, I'm I'm learning. <laughs> okay. I, I really enjoy. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting better at identifying the, uh, the different oaks, and uh, it's, very, it's very helpful to know these little specific uh, stories about the trees and the, the pen oak, who knew <laughs> that the wood was used for the pens, yeah. and I didn't realize how important the nails were uh, for the people who were building these early houses as they moved west, including here. <clears throat> But I don't see any messages right now. So if you want I'll to keep it on. So resume share right there. Okay. 
alternate simple variable loads. And again, this is how I've broken them out on the table. So we're down to, what tree are we? We're down to tree 11. We've got 10 out of 50 down. But this, the idea of this table, if you carry this with you, I'm sorry that I don't have figures on it. It would be nice if I could, uh, could also put graphics on it, but you can only squeeze so much onto one page. But if you go down to the column on the left, all, if you have alternate simple leaves, it'll be on this first page. Then if you have, if it has leaves with uniform lobes, you'll be one of the 10 trees I just went through. And then now we're going to talk about four trees with variable lobes. That's the second group on the table. So I'm going through them in the same sequence and I have on the right side comments and, and key traits. I think between those, you have a pretty good chance of properly identifying a tree with minimal information. And of course, you can always go to the guidebooks if you want a lot of information. Okay, so this is an interesting one and that's sassafras. Sassafras is unmistakable once you've learned its leaves. It has four distinctly different leaf shapes. It's got left-handed mittens, right-handed mittens, two-thumbed mittens, and no-thumbed mittens. It has in winter traits, it has green twigs and it is alternate. There's another tree with distinctly green winter twigs, but it is opposite. That'll be late in the talk. But green twigs, alternate sassafras. Sassafras is where root beer comes from. The flavor is usually synthesized nowadays unless you buy the good stuff, but the pioneers and the natives before them would dig up the bark, peel the, dig up the roots, peel off the bark, and then boil it to make a tea out of it. If you add sugar and yeast and let it ferment, that's root beer. That's where the name comes from. It's sarsaparilla is the other name for it. It is a lumber species in much of the country, but they typically don't get that big in Ohio. I saw some in a cemetery in Dayton that were at least five feet in diameter. They were huge. Usually in central Ohio, though, they seem to be kind of uh, scrubby, just more like shrubs, but the leaves are unmistakable. The bark is rather distinctive. It's dark and blocky, but you can see orange sometimes down between the, uh, between the blocks. And if you scrape at it, yeah, and smell it, scratch and sniff, it'll smell to me more like menthol, but it's kind of a sassafras smell to some people. So that's sassafras. The leaves are unmistakable in summer. Mulberry also has distinctively different leaves. You can see a leaf there on the left. It's got not only different leaves, well, it's got kind of willy-nilly leafing pattern, lobing pattern. This one has three lobes on the left and I guess it's two lobes on the left, one on the end, one lobe on the right. You might have to look close to convince yourself that you're not looking at something where a bug ate into the leaf, but you'll see when you look close that they have sometimes lots of lobes. A good many will have no lobes. The leaves are rather shiny, but there's the mulberry fruit in the second picture. <clears throat> Trees can be just weighed down with these. The mulberry is a prized tree in Europe and Asia. It has a beautiful gold colored lumber and the fruit in Europe is the black mulberry, which is a high quality fruit, something like a uh, raspberry or a blackberry. They're edible in Ohio too, that people used to like to make wine out of them. I guess some people still do. It's edible and I've, under, I've heard that they cost quite a bit if you buy them in the store, but in the US, we're used to buying our fruit and buying candy, et cetera. So we, we don't value them so much here. They're regarded as a trash tree, I'm afraid. Two species common in Ohio is the native red mulberry, but also the imported white mulberry. It was brought in from China in the 1800s because the leaves were fed to silkworms. The business didn't take off, but we still have lots of white mulberries. It's regarded as an invasive, I'm not good at telling the difference between white and red mulberries. The white mulberry tree has whiter mulberries, but except when it's in fruit, I don't know a good trait to tell them apart. The berries also get red or black on the white mulberries, just not as much. The lobes can be more common on the white mulberries, but I've seen some red mulberry trees with labels on them. I'm pretty sure I was looking at the right, at a red mulberry and they did, they had a whole lot of lobes too. So 
usually if it's got a whole lot of lobes, I think it's probably a white. If it doesn't, it's probably a red. But I don't feel too bad because a lot of times, again, when you buy lumber, if you buy red oak, it's red oak. If you buy white oak, it's white oak. They don't make the species distinction. Same with mulberry. If you were to buy mulberry lumber, that would certainly be a specialty lumber. But they probably wouldn't tell you it's white or red. It's just plain mulberry. That's true of a lot of the trees we'll talk about. Recognition feature is that it tends to have a lot of twigs. Look at the branches there in the third picture from the left. You see a whole lot of twigs coming off of the primary branches. Again, a good freeway tree. You won't always see that, but it's common to see that proliferation of small twigs. And when it's young, it's got a lot of twigs coming off the uh, trunk. Maybe half of the trees have purple sap running down them from where they have a split or a wound of some sort. That's a good winter recognition feature. Mulberry, I should mention too, is dioecious. It is one of the two, well, there's more than two trees. It and its close relative, the hedge apple, are dioecious, meaning, meaning it has male flowers on one tree, female flowers on the other. So you can't identify the uh, species on the basis of the fruits on a male tree because it's not going to bear any. But that is where the classification comes from is the fruit. Here's another tree with variable leaves, and that is the hawthorn. The hawthorn is also called the Mayflower. It was a symbol of hope. It was also a symbol of death in some cultures. I think to the Romans, it was a symbol of death, but it was often a symbol of hope. Uh, it, it blooms in the spring and it's what the, uh, what the famous boat was named for. The leaves are variable in a couple of senses. Hawthorns are a hugely variable group. There are over 400 species, more than 60 just in Ohio. Most people, including me, don't know all the species. Um, I see some common recognizable shapes, like these ones, the leaves on the right there, kind of maple looking. There are a lot of the hawthorns have leaves like the one picture in the middle. They're more of a spoon shape. They have small teeth, but really no lobes to speak of. What's distinctive? Well, two things are, are different about the lobes. They're variable because there are so many different ones, but the lobes are also variable sometimes even on the tree. Those two leaves on the right were plucked from the same tree uh, up in Toledo about a month ago. They were plucked from the same tree just a few inches apart. They have the same general shape, but the one on, leaf on the left is distinctly lobed, the one on the right is not. They produce a fruit very much like an apple. They have a five petal white flower, much like the crab apple, and they're related to the, to the crab apples. And they're eaten like crab apples. You'll find hawthorn candy sometimes in Mexican food stores. It tastes pretty much like an apple fruit roll up, but it is edible. And those are called haws, H-A-W. And it's got big, long, unbranched thorns. Hence the name hawthorn. So your best winter recognition feature or because of the possible confusion over the differences of lobes, look for the long single thorns. There are other trees with thing, single thorns, but not that long. There are trees, there's another tree with a long thorn, but it is branched. So long single thorn, hawthorn. And the fourth tree I'll show you with variable lobes in Ohio is the river birch. Now this is from what I've read. I, I wouldn't call those leaves in the middle I wouldn't even think of them as lobe. They look more like big teeth to me. And the, the river birches I've seen in Ohio are usually typical of that, but I've read in the guides and I've seen other guides that classify them as variably lobed because they can have longer lobes and sinuses in between. Never mind that, the distinctive feature of river birch is the bark. That picture on the left with the peeling bark, orange or pink in color, is very characteristic. And you may recall from last week, I talked about trees by definition, USDA definition of a tree, it's got a single trunk, but this is the exception. If you don't prune them, they often have multiple trunks and they're popular for landscaping for that reason. So if you see the papery bark and the multiple trunks, good bet that it's a river birch, but they do get to be full sized, especially if they have only a single trunk, they'll be 80 feet, couple feet in diameter, and it's a good furniture wood. 
but that's mostly in the southern U.S. It's not so much a lumber species here, but they can get good sized. Okay, same general plan, simple, alternate leaves. Want to listen to it? But these have lopsided bases. Okay, I've got some talking here, and we can have questions if you like, but I think we'll wait for just a little bit here and come back to questions later. If you don't have a question, please mute. So alternate simple, no lobes, but a lopsided base, American L. The next picture has a, an even more lopsided base. But if you look at the leaf here, you can see that the leaf that comes down farther, closer to the, farther down the stem, closer to the twig on one side of the leaf than the other. It has a double sawtooth pattern. It's got, it's got smallish teeth with smaller teeth in between. So two different sized teeth. The elms have a distinctive seed. It's called a, it's called a Samara. A number of the trees have Samaras, but that's a fancy name for a seed with a wafer. And the elm leaves are more or less disc shaped with a single seed in the middle. The American elm is distinctive and having a little notch, a fairly distinct notch at the end of the seed. And both of the common American, both of the common elms in Ohio, the American elm and the next one, have spongy bark. You can poke it with your finger and it kind of bounces back. That's a good trait for winter recognition is a spongy, corky feeling bark. <clears throat> As you probably know, the American elm is nearly extinct from a disease that was introduced in the early 1900s and it really took off in the 50s. Most of the mature elms are dead. The smaller ones are still sprouting up from roots, but they might never get big if we don't have it ever figure out a way to, which the, to whip the uh, Dutch elm disease. It's caused by a beetle that goes into the tree and carries a fungus with it. It's actually the fungus that kills the tree. It was a good lumber species. Elm is very split resistant. It's got a cross grain. So unlike ash, oak, and hickory, you can't split it to save your life. It would make miserable firewood, but a use of elm, it was used for a number of different furniture uses. You couldn't split it down to length. You'd have to saw all of your pieces and then plane them, but it was strong. It was a good medium weight, medium hardness. And you know, the pioneers didn't always want the hardest wood. A lot of times I tend to like oak because it's hard and I figure it won't break very easily but I'm working with power tools. If I was doing everything with hand tools, I'd be looking for the wood that was hard enough to do the job, but not too hard. And now might be that tree. Because it's split resistant, one of its many uses was making wagon wheel tops. If you were making a wooden wagon wheel, you would typically use a piece of elm, turn it into a cylinder, or chop it down into a cylinder, drive, cut holes in it, and then you would get a good splitting wood, especially a strong springy, springy one like hickory, make your spokes, and then hammer those spokes down into the holes. And because elm is split resistant, you wouldn't split it in half. You could drive those spokes in at various angles into the holes and not split your hub. So the pioneers knew all that stuff. They knew exactly what tree to use for what purpose. They'd make the wagon wheel hub out of elm. They'd make the spokes out of hickory. Here's the other elm, the one that's still common in Ohio, for whatever reason, not affected by the Dutch elm disease. You can see in that middle picture, the distinctly asymmetrical leaf, the way it comes down much farther on one side than the other, comes farther down the stem. There's a similar seed on the right, the Samara, a disc with a seed in the middle, doesn't have such a distinct notch. And again, the bark is kind of spongy, excuse me. And there's a bunch of seeds on that picture on the left. Here's, an, here's the elm relative. It is not in the same genus, but it is in the same family and the lumber looks a lot alike. This is an important lumber species. I should have mentioned slippery elm. The distinctive thing with slippery elm, the, it has a leaf that looks a lot like the American elm. But ironically, the leaf is very rough. If you rub it between your thumb and forefingers, the slippery elm is 
sandpapery and you'll actually hear the rubbing because it's so rough. What's slippery in the slippery elm is the stuff underneath the bark that the natives and the pioneers peeled up and scraped off to make a substance that they use for me medicine, including a sort of cough suppressant. So it's a slippery elm. Hackberry, similar lumber, same family, but it does not have a wafer seed. It has a berry about the size of a pea. Their berries are, are larger and sweeter in the South. They call them sugar berries there. I think they're more or less the same species or a variety of the species, but the hackberry has these round berries. The bark is different too from the other two elms. It's distinctive, but not in the same way. It is not soft and spongy. It's like it's smooth, but it's got these hard ridges on it. I've heard likened to a bunch of worms crawling up a tree. And again, the bark is not always obvious in a photograph, but when you see it in the uh, field, it, it can be really distinctive. Another distinctive trait of the hackberry, especially in the winter, maybe half of the hackberry tree, trees have these distinctive witches brooms in them. These witches brooms in the middle in the left picture are clusters of twigs that grow out where there's a viral or maybe a fungal infestation. And again, it's a freeway tree. You'll see those things, they, you might mistake it for a bird nest, but they look rather different when you've seen a few of them. And you can spot those when you're driving along in the winter, you can nail it, the hackberry. If you're up a little closer, the bark is very distinctive. Leaf looks pretty much like the previous two. Another tree with a lopsided base, but this one is not nearly as long as the elm. It's almost round, and that is the basswood. There are several species <clears throat> that grow in Ohio. <clears throat> Excuse me, basswood, also called linden. This is a relatively soft wood, and it's got hardly any grain direction, so it's very popular for carving and for making small woodenware. If I, I spent a couple of years in Germany. And the statues of a lot of the woodwork was made out of linden. You can carve good detail. The altars of the churches and all that kind of thing were often made of linden. What's distinctive about basswood besides leaves are these so-called bracts, B-R-A-C-T. A bract is a sort of a modified leaf. And you can see there in my left hand, it has like two leaf shapes. It's got the typical leaf, but then that, that bract on the right is a long skinny thing that serves like a parachute to the seed. At the end of the year, the seeds come down and the bract will hold on to it and act like a parachute to help them disperse downwind, much the way maple seeds you probably are familiar with, and I'll show you later. They take off in the wind and that helps the tree spread itself and propagate. You'll often find these bracts hanging on the tree, at least a few of them, even in the winter. And in the summer, they're distinctive because a lot of times you'll see these two, what look like two different leaf shapes, one round, one long and skinny. And a lot of times they're distinctly different colors. Usually the bracts are lighter in color than the other. And it's one of those things, again, that once you see it, you can't unsee it. You wonder how you ever missed it before. There's this tree with the two leaf shapes. One is a leaf, the other is a bract. That's basswood. Okay, same general pad plan, alternate simple leaves without lobes now. Symmetrical though these, and they have teeth. And after that, we'll get to untoothed ones. Should have mentioned, you may recall from the previous, from the previous talk last week, I have numbers in the lower right and yellow. This is number 72. If you have a question, jot down the number and it might, it'll make it easier for me to go back to it. This is a very common one, and that is cottonwood. Cottonwood looks a fair amount. The leaf looks a fair amount like the previous basswood, but the leaf is symmetrical. It's triangular. Uh, the triangle is delta shaped. Uh, deltoid mean, you know, means triangular, and uh, the Latin name is deltoides. It's a populus deltoides. This is one of the tr two true poplars I'll show you. Poplars are very soft. This is even softer. One of the softest so-called hardwoods in Ohio. I think it's in the bottom three or four in terms of hardness. It's got a low density. It's a third the density of water. The specific gravity would be 0.33. Very light. It has virtually no commercial value. It is sometimes used for pulp, 
they make good paper pulp and they get huge fast. That tree on the right is several feet in diameter and they can grow three or four feet in a hundred years, I'm told. They're commonly found around water. They grow along rivers together with the sycamore, but because they because of where they grow they're, and they're as soft as they are, they're not very useful. They're not used a whole lot for, uh, for lumber. They make pallets out of them, just about any wood you read about that say, well, I make pallets out of it. Very low rot resistance, almost impossible to split, so it's not even very good for firewood. If you did cut it up, it wouldn't burn very hot because it's just not much to it once it dries out. And this is the stuff that's known for the uh, cotton that it puts out, cotton-like uh, substance that carries the seeds away in the wind. Distinctive bark feature, it's very light in color, and it's got very deep furrows in between the ridges. It also trembles in the wind a lot. If you're driving along, and again, a good freeway tree, the leaves are a bit shiny. If you're driving down 315 here in Columbus, and you see a lot of trees along the river shaking in the wind, it'll pick up the wind before pretty much any other tree. So you see it kind of shaking, that's a good freeway trait to recognize the cottonwood. Same with its cousin, the quaking aspen. Quaking because it picks up the, the slightest wind. And uh, the round leaf shape there is the reason why, together with the fact that the quaking aspen has a flat stem. There's some question as to why they quake in the wind. Is that actually a good, is that some kind of an advantage to them from an evolutionary standpoint? One speculation is that it helps them get rid of water, that they get more water than they need, but as long as they have a way to get rid of it, then they can outcompete a lot of the other trees by moving around in a slight wind and helps them dissipate water. Characteristic besides the uh, shape of the leaf there, almost circular, tiny little teeth. It's got a very light colored bark, almost white, and uh, they don't tend to get very big. The quaking aspen is the most widespread tree in North America. It's about the only hardwood you'll see up in Alaska and northern regions, and it's a pioneer tree. After fires, after uh, landslides, it'll move right in and often come up from a single, single root, and you'll have biologically a single tree covering a large area. Another alternate no lobe, simple, symmetrical tooth is the black cherry. <clears throat> this is not the cherry that we make pies out of. They have small cherries, uh, again, about pea-sized and a big pit. The pioneers and the natives use them to flavor things. They might put them in pemmican. The natives would put them in pemmican. Pioneers like to flavor whiskeys and medicines with them, but the lumber is valuable. You can see the red characteristic red color and that stump in the middle. Best recognition feature for cherry is not the leaf, it is the bark. You can see this so-called burnt cornflake or burnt potato chip. It's often described the burnt cornflake bark on the right. Those plates are maybe an inch. It's distinctively darker than most of the trees around it. And if you look up close, you see those little pores on the bark, that second picture from the right is a close-up of the bark that shows the so-called lenticels. The lenticels are pores that are said to allow breathing from the interior to the exterior of the tree. And even before the tree develops its characteristic bark shape, you'll see this dark color on the little saplings with those conspicuous lenticels on it. But the cherry is one that has pretty characteristic bark throughout its life and it's very easy to recognize by that. You can recognize it also by the flowers. It's got five petals like the other members of the family, the rose family, uh, typically five petals like the apple, cherry, pear, five petals, but these grow in clusters. An apple couldn't grow in clusters because it'd be too heavy and it would pull the tree down. But cherries are small, so you'll see those flowers on the left grow in clusters on a single stalk. And later on, you'll see these little pea-sized green fruits and later red fruits hanging from a single stalk. That's, again, characteristic of cherry. But the bark is the most obvious trait to me. Same general plan, that is the beach. Beach is the one with a silvery bark. You can see on the right, people nearly always 
carve their name into the things and it's harmful for the tree. Obviously, I would discourage you from doing that. The trees close to the trail typically get carvings in them. Beech is a high quality wood. It doesn't have the long grain, but it's hard. It doesn't tend to split. It is very popular in Europe. I've seen a lot of European woodenware made out of beech. A lot of the furniture you'll see like at uh, Ikea is made out of beech. It's uh, good lumber quality, not terribly rot resistant, but one of the distinctive traits besides the obvious bark, if you look at the leaves, they have kind of chevron, almost straight veins coming off that central vein, pinnately veined, and they have very distinctive buds in the winter. The, you can see the visible scales on them, kind of cigar shaped, and the leaves are persistent, like the other members of the family, the oaks. There's a couple of reasons, a couple of potential reasons for why the leaves are persistent and hold on to the wind and through the winter. But the, the explanation I like is that it discourages the, lead, the deer from browsing on the buds. The deer like to eat these buds, but if there are a lot of papery leaves hanging on around them, it would make the buds perhaps less palatable. So it's a survival trait. And something that bolsters that theory is that they don't hold on to all of their leaves. They hold on to the leaves only for about the bottom 10 feet because there's cost to holding on to leaves if they get a lot of wind or if there's a freezing rain, then the weight or the wind could cause the branches to break off. So by having no persistent leaves in the upper tree part of the tree, but only in the lower 10 feet or so, then they have minimal risk of damage from wind and, and freezing rain and they protect themselves from browsing deer. So that makes, that seems like a good theory to me. But they have a very distinctive leaf that they'll hold on to through much of the winter, most of the winter. Same general group. And that is the, this one's got several names. This is called ironwood. If you recall from a, uh, last week, there are over a hundred trees in the world called ironwood because they're unusually hard. Ohio has two really hard woods, but not the hardest in the state, but they're, they're both called ironwood. This and the next one are both called ironwood. This one in particular is called the muscle wood. If you look at the bark and there's two left pictures of the trunk, it's a smooth bark, kind of like the beach, but they also have ripples in them. They look like sinewy muscles. So they're often called muscle wood. The third more, more, com more proper name, I guess, Pro, the more proper common name is the American hornbeam. Hornbeam is Germanic for hard wood. The hornbeams, this and the one after it, have a very smooth wood and unusually hard. There are a few harder woods, but the wood wasn't as smooth. So if you want something that's really hard and smooth, this would be your choice. The pioneers used the hornbeams to make things like wooden planes. Metal was very dear. We, we consider it was very costly to make and typically chop down trees before they were using coal and coke for, for making coal, for making steel and iron. It was a very costly process to make iron. And so they made things out of, they would make a, a plane, a wood, woodworker's plane out of wood. And the only metal part on it would typically be the blade itself. These guys were so hard and because of the smooth, smoothness, this and the next horn beam were even used to make uh, wedges for splitting lo other logs open. So they'd, they'd start, a, start, the, uh, start to split with their ax and then they'd hammer wedges made of the so-called ironwood into it to open it up and crack the wood so they could split it down to smaller pieces. So that's the American horn beam, the muscle wood. It's got a double sawtooth pattern, very much like the leaf on the left. You're hard pressed to tell them apart just by the leaves. But the Eastern hop horn beam has also distinct bark, but looks nothing like the previous horn beam. The Eastern hop horn beam, the other ironwood, has this, what I always describe as looking like cat scratch bark. It's almost shredded looking. It looks like a cat just scraped down the whole tree and you've got these fissures only about three eighths of an inch apart, very narrow strips of bark. For a few weeks a year, you see the distinctive looking hop looking fruit. I don't think it tasted anything like hops, but they look like beer hops. That's where it gets its name, Eastern Hop Horn Beam.
neither of the iron woods get very big. The previous one, the muscle wood, might get 30 feet high, six inches in diameter, it's pretty hefty. The eastern hophorn beam with a cat scratch looking bark gets quite a bit bigger, but 15, 16 inches in diameter. Trunk is a really big one. Doesn't get more than 40, maybe 50 feet high. Willow. There are over 20 willows in Ohio. I don't know them apart. Most people don't. The most common is a black willow. Not all willows, but in Ohio, the willows typically have these long skinny leaves. This long skinny leaves is so characteristic that in fact, another couple of trees are named but well, one, for example, a southern tree is called the willow oak. It's one of the others that doesn't have any lobes. It's got long, skinny leaves that reminded people of willows. I'll caution you, there are a few willows elsewhere in the country that don't have long, skinny leaves. It's classified on the basis of its fruits and flowers. Uh, if you look at just above this, just to the upper right of the center on that left picture, you see a little cattail sort of thing. That's part of its distinctive flower. The wood is very soft, doesn't have any commercial value for furniture for the most part, but they did, they did sometimes make curved chairs out of the wood because they could take poles of a couple of inches in diameter and it bent very well, especially while it was still green. I should mention, by the way, that the settlers usually would work their wood while it was still green. The iron wood would have been too hard to work with hand tools. So they worked it while it was green and then they let it dry. And they would have bent the willow while it was green. And then when it dries, then you've got a nice hard chair or whatever. But they used some parts, they used twigs and branches for some of the furniture members, they wouldn't be the strongest, but you could make a good chair out of it. And they would often cut down the trees and then let the, the sprouts come up from the stump. And some trees could be really prolific. The willow was popular for doing that. They called that pollarding, P-O-L-L-A-R-D. I've known a few pollards in my life. They were probably named for an ancestor who chopped down trees and cut down the shoot, the shoots coming off of it. You let that come up to a chute and it's flexible and you could uh, make like woven furniture out of it, wicker type of furniture out of it. So that's a willow, but a very soft wood. Typically likes water, you probably know that. The weeping willow is the most familiar one to most people. It is not a native, but there are over 20 natives in Ohio. Now we're getting to same general plan, but these guys have no teeth. This is the tree I mentioned is related to the mulberry. This is the hedge apple. It's got several names. It's got the name Osage Orange and the name hedge apple. It, like mulberry, is dioecious. It has fruits only on the female trees. And so if you have a male, you could never distinguish it on the basis of the fruits. That's why we use the leaves. Leaves are kind of nondescript. They're just a uh, little longer than wide, they're kind of pointy at the end, no teeth or lobes or anything. But what you do see is that picture on the left, you can see there in front of my finger, is a thorn. It is one of the several thorned trees in Ohio. It's single and short. They're usually no more than half an inch long. The hedge apple fruit is very distinctive. It's the largest fruit of any Ohio tree. And it's not edible to people, but some cattle and other various wildlife eats it. I've heard it discourages uh, spiders, but I've also spe seen spiders walking right over it. The shape is distinctive. It tends to be low. They can get fairly straight, but they tend to be low and bushy. And that's where it gets, it gets the name hedge apple. They're native to only a small part of Eastern Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, but the Pioneers brought them to Ohio and planted the seeds to make fences. It was a living fence. It's thorny, it's dense and shrubby. And it, it you know, planted itself and made a beautiful hedgerow or a fence. The wood is the heaviest and hardest of any Ohio tree. It's uh, extremely hard. It's like 0.75 or 0.8 in density. It's 80% the density of water very hard, it's orange in color. The pioneers also would chop it up. It had a water soluble orange color. The pioneers and the natives 
would chop it up, boil it to get an orange dye. And you can see, like the mulberry on the right, is a root. A lot of times you'll see exposed roots with a distinctly orange bark. There's a good bet that it's a mulberry or a, uh, an Osage orange. Indians, the natives made bows out of it. It was strong and springy and it was a favorite. It was the, the best tree for making bows in this part of the world at least. Another tree of the same general plan, but heart-shaped leaves, typically about three or four inches across, that is the red bud. Red buds don't get real big. You see a picture there on the left. It's a very popular landscape tree. It is native to Ohio, uh, more of an understory tree. Doesn't have any commercial use that I know of, but it doesn't need it, it's so lovely. It's in the legume family. Most, but not all of the legumes, as you probably know, put nitrogen back in the soil, they're good for that. Not all of the legumes do. I, I'm trying to remember, I think one of the locusts don't. But what makes a legume a legume, again, is the fruit. It's got a seed pod with multiple seeds in it. They look similar to the snow peas you'd find in Asian food. About the same size, a little longer and skinnier. So that is the red bud. Papa. This is the largest edible fruit for people, the largest edible fruit in Ohio. There was either fruits on the left, lower left, or pawpaws. They're like the size of a small potato. They have a distinctive taste, something like uh, mango, I guess, or maybe like, uh, oh, it's word I want. Yeah, something like mango. And pawpaw got its name because when the Europeans came to America, they thought they were related to papaya. So that's, that's a name that Europeans gave it. They're curious in that they have a long, very long leaf. Those leaves on the right are more than a foot long. They're wide, but it's a small tree. They rarely get more than maybe four or five inches in diameter. They were brought, to, well, they weren't, they weren't brought, they were planted in the U.S. in the 1800s with the idea they'd be an important fruit crop, but they have big seeds and they don't have a good shelf life. So they didn't pan out. <coughs> Excuse me, they have a beautiful flower in the spring. There are those two things in the second picture from the left. Beautiful kind of purplish flower with three petals and then another three petals inside of those. So it's a very interesting tree. No commercial uses other than pawpaws, which aren't a major fruit crop. A lot of these, by the way, have medicinal value. And as I mentioned, that book, Leaves, gives good descriptions of that. Pawpaw environmentally is the critical food to the swallowtail butterfly. So I've planted some in my backyard and they're doing well. They're also tolerant of walnut trees. So, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, we're out of the alternate simple leaves. Woo! So, and we're in a new group now in terms of leaf habits. These are still alternate. The leaves are left, right, left, right, not directly across from each other. And we're going to talk about the pinnately compound leaves, that icon in the middle has seven leaflets attached to a stem. And the leaflets are attached at different points, all of which will come off and, uh, at, the, at the end of the year. I do want to mention that the you have to look closely when you're looking at alternate versus opposite on the compound leaves. I don't want you to get, to get confused. That compound leaf is I show in the middle figure. Those leaflets are opposite of each other. That does not make the tree opposite. How are those overall leaves attached to the tree? You can see that's a honey locust on the right. The actual picture, that's a honey locust. Those leaflets may be directly across from each other, but the leaves are very clearly, you can see upper left, the next leaf down, the next compound unit on the, on the right, and the next one down on the left, and the bottom one is on the right. So however the leaflets are arranged on the stem doesn't count, the leaves are on the tree in an alternate fashion, left, right, left, right. So this is a compound alternate leaf. And the branches will be alternate as well. Black locust, I just mentioned the locust. The thorns are similar. You can see on the right side there, the thorns 
are similar in size to a rose and look quite a bit like the thorn, a lot like the thorn on the Osage orange, the hedge apple I just showed you, but they grow in distinct pairs. You see there, there are pairs there. When the leaves are on, you, the paired thorns will be at the base of the leaves, and they are another form of a stipule, a modified leaf of sorts. Those are the leaves on the left, compound leaflets. They're groundish, uh, maybe half again or twice as long as they are wide, but otherwise pretty ground. And there you'll find maybe 20 or so leaflets on a stem. Those are the flowers in the middle. They're beautiful, fragrant flowers in the, in the uh, early summer. They hang together like uh, grape clusters. Black locust, I don't, didn't show a picture. It's got a small pea, small, it's a legume. It has a small pod, much like the uh, red bud or like a snow pea. This is the other locust. They're not really that closely related. They're not together at the genus level. They're in the same family. But this locust has so similar leaf plan. It's got these rounded leaves attached to a stem. But this is one of our two doubly compound leaves that you can see the picture on the left. I've got each of those leaves have somewhere in the order of 20, a couple dozen leaflets attached to a stem. And I've got about a dozen stems attached to a bigger stem. That whole unit is one leaf, one big doubly compound leaf that falls off at the end of the year. And they'll be on stout twigs. Again, in my mind, a, a slender twig is like a pencil lead in diameter and a fatter twig, a stout twig is more like the pencil itself in diameter or heavier. So these will be, these would have relatively stout twigs. It has a distinctive seed pot on the right, the honey locust. Typically, that, they get larger than that. They get over a foot long and they're flat, about the size of a banana or larger if you sliced it lengthwise. They've got pods in there and between, I've got, I'm sorry, they've got hard beans in there about the size of a lima bean. And in between the beans is a sweet paste. You you may have, if you like a foreign foods, and if you like, I think A1 sauce, and a number of foods have tamarind as a flavoring in them. You can even buy tamarind candy at the uh, Asian and Mexican food departments. Tamarind is a, is a similar locust family member that has a sweet paste in between the seeds. People used to not have candy available to them and they would eat the paste in between the seeds of the honey locust. It was, it was tasty to them. The most distinctive trait of the honey locust are these branched thorns. They have these huge branched thorns, uh, six inches long or even a foot sometimes, unlike the longish thorns, two inches or so from the uh, hawthorn, these are branched. The hawthorns are single. So that's the single best way to tell them apart. Third member of the locust family in Ohio is the Kentucky coffee tree. It gets its name from the fact that people say the hard brown seeds inside that pod were ground up and used as a coffee substitute, but I've also read that the, that the seeds and the paste and every part of the tree was mildly toxic and that the beans only resemble a coffee bean physically because they're hard and dark brown. I don't know what's the case. It is a lumber species. Uh, all three of the locusts are lumber species, but the uh, Kentucky coffee tree is probably the most common. It's a little more common as a lumber tree in the south. It is also doubly compound. And so you can see that tree on the right in the winter has those huge long stems. Those stems, those longer ones are like two feet long. They had smaller stems and leaflets on those smaller stems attached. They often have those persistent fruits that are very distinctive, so it's a good freeway tree. You can pick them out. The bark looks quite a bit like white oak, as does the honey locust. The, they have overlapping plates, but the seed pods are so distinctively different. And the honey locust has the branch thorns, so you wouldn't mistake it for a white oak. The leaflets on this are quite a bit larger than the previous two, and you can see that they're pointed on that left picture, whereas the black locust and the honey locust don't have points at the end of the leaflets. Black walnut, this is the valuable lumber species. 
This is the one that the nice dark brown furniture comes from. Gun stocks were popularly made out of it. Moderately hard, density of 0.55, et cetera. So it's a good all-purpose lumber. Uh, if it wasn't so costly, we'd, we might make everything out of it or a whole lot of things out of it. This, however, is not the walnut that we eat. The walnut that you eat is the English walnut. It's got a lot less resistant shell and it's got a, a sweeter flavor. A little bit of bitterness to a typical walnut, but the black walnut flavor is quite a bit more bitter. A lot of people don't like it anymore. It was a popular flavoring in the early 1900s and in the 1800s. My grandparents always had hard candy around with a little kernel of black walnut in the middle of it. I kind of liked it and kind of didn't. Now I like it if not for nothing more than nostalgic purposes, but it's a beautiful lumber and valuable if only for that. The leaves you see there on the right are compound. The leaves are several inches, leafluts are several inches long and pointed. And you can see them in that second picture from the right. And again, you can pick out the compound leaves. It doesn't take too long to get an eye for it because you see these characteristic clusters of leaflets. The We'll get to the Buckeyes later, but the native Ohio, the native Buckeyes in Ohio have five leaflets. These clearly have more, somewhere in the order of 20 groups of 20 leaflets. Those are compound leaves. The twigs are distinctive in the winter. The, the bark is pretty distinctive too. It takes a little getting an eye for, but it's dark and kind of blocky. But the twigs are very distinctive. You see the twig on the left there, the far left, has these leaf scars where the leaf were attached. These were attached. People describe those as looking like monkey faces. So the monkey faces on the twigs tell you what's walnut. And if you split a twig, you can see that second picture from the left. If you look up close, there are little layers separating the chambers and the pith. It's described as having chambered pith. So that's a black walnut. Also in the same family as the walnuts, are the hickories. Pecan is a hickory. In fact, it's the same at the genus level. So hickory is really not that different. <coughs> Excuse me, a, a pecan is, is not really distinctly different from the hickories, except that it doesn't grow well in Ohio. The shagbark hickory has a, a good edible nut, tastes very much like pecan. I don't think I'd know the difference. <coughs> Excuse me, I think it may be even a slightly sweeter, but it's a much smaller fruit. It's got a very hard nut. It's got the same look. It's got those like two brains stuck together like walnuts and pecans. It's got the same look as those other nuts, but it's not a good commercial uh, nut crop because the seeds are small and hard to get at. Very high quality lumber. You probably recall that Andrew Jackson was called Old Hickory because he was tough and resistant. And again, this is one of the three woods in Ohio that split very well. It's got that ring, the ring porosity where the, the large pores are lined up along the rings. And so it splits well to make tool handles and that kind of thing. Axe, handle, ha, axe handles, hammer handles were typically made out of hickory. It's strong, it's resistant, and it's got a good parallel grain. Many people recognize the shagbark hickory simply by the bark there on the left. It's hard to mistake. However, this is one that does not keep the same characteristic bark throughout its age. The younger trees, this one in the middle, is maybe four or five inches in diameter. Before it gets really shaggy, it looks to me almost like a fingerprint. It's smooth with very shallow furrows in it. You, you get used to that, but and you, you tell by the leaflets and the leaves, it's typically got five leaflets there on the right attached to the uh, stem. And uh, so that's, that's shagbark hickory, but it won't get its shagginess until later. Again, it's good to learn. It's good to learn to look at everything. You'll recognize the big ones from the uh, bark then start looking at the leaves. And when you learn to recognize the leaves, then you'll start picking out the ones without the characteristic bark, but that's shag bark. It's got a close relative, mocker nut hickory. Mocker nut hickory also has an edible nut to people and good tasting, but a lot smaller. The shag bark already is real big for the work it takes to get it. Mocker nut is tasty, but takes even more work. And it's claimed that that's why the 
why they call it mocker nut it mocks you after you spend all that trouble getting the nut out of it but it's a good quality lumber also not as good as a shag bark but it's got a lot more leaflets so good old countology it's got seven to nine neat leaflets mocker the uh, shag bark has five but in other respects they look pretty solid Bitter nut hickory has a distinctively different bark and the lumber is not as high a quality as the shag bark is the best of them. But again, if you go to a lumber yard and you buy hickory, you're buying hickory. They're probably not going to be able to tell you which one. You would not mistake the bark of a bitter nut hickory for a shag bark. It's got this diamond pattern and the bark looks quite a bit like ash, which we'll talk about later. But the Diamond pattern isn't quite as pronounced. What is distinctive, you can count the leaflets. It's got seven to 11 leaflets. The shag bark would have five. But in the winter, it's got this yellow bud. It's, it's cool because in the winter, you don't have a whole lot of color. So when you do see it, you enjoy it. It's got a distinctly often described as, as a mustard color, not the yellow mustard, but more the natural mustard color or uh, sulfur colored bud so that's how you can pick out the bitter nut hickory the nuts are not good for people even animals don't care for them if you find a lot of uh, hickory nuts underneath a tree and nothing seems to be eating them it's probably a bitter nut hickory pig nut hickory is not as good as a shag bark but pigs will eat them similar it's got similar looking bark kind of diamondy looking stuff but five leaflets instead of, instead of seven to 11. So that's the pig nut. Again, the lumber is used in pretty much the way as the other hickories. Hard, heavy, strong, parallel grain. All right, we're still in the alternates, but getting near the end of the alternates. These, these compound leaves are palmately compound. The previous ones, the walnuts, the hickory, I forget, we had another couple, I think. They have palmately, comp they had pinnately compound where the leaflets are attached at different places. These, the leaflets all come together at a point, like looking at the fingers in the palm of your hand. This is a distinctive one and an interesting one, not valuable in any commercial sense. This is a common hop tree. A good place to look for the common hop tree if you go to the Patel Darby Walk. Patel Darby Metro Park in Franklin County. There's an Indian mound on the so-called Ancients Trail. Right across from the mound are gobs of these things. They're not at all big. They're somewhere between a shrub and a tree, but they have three compound leaflets like clover. You, just if you look down at a field of clover, you'll notice all these clusters of three leaves. You don't have to count them. You can just see that with your, just, just by eye. Same thing, they have groups of three leaflets. They have these wafer seeds, very much like an elm samara you see on the left, but they have two little seeds inside that wafer and they're bitter. They were used to make medicine. The pioneers used to figure that anything bad tasting must be good for you. So they made medicine out of them. Out of them. And unlike the, I mentioned the hop hornbeam, they had a fruit that looked like hops. These don't look anything like hops, but they were, had a taste close enough to hops that the pioneers made beer with them. So they used the common hop tree to make beer and medicines. And of course, beer is good for you. So that's a common hop tree. We'll see a leaf at the very end, three leaflets, but it is opposite. This one's alternate. Okay, now we are out of the alternate trees and at the opposites. Let's take a Quick break here for questions, Chuck. Any any more questions come in before we get to the last group? No, I don't see any questions, but uh, if anybody has one, they can put it in the chat. Good yeah. enough. We'll save them for the end then. Yeah. All right. So this is something you've heard if you've been on any tree ID hikes as likely as not in Ohio. Your major trees that have opposite branching, where it looks like a went in once, the branch went in one side and came out the other side of the tree. Those are the mad box, maple, ash, dogwood, buckeye. 
mad buck, natal ash, dogwood, buckeye. There are also some shrubs with opposite branching, but these get to tree size. Oh, I want to mention here, look at the maple, the upper left picture. If you look at the buds on the twig, they're opposite too. They're directly across from each other. It's often a good idea to look for the newer growth because if you have an opposite tree and the branch breaks off, it won't be opposite. And of course, the longer the tree is around, the, the more chance it has to lose branches and twigs. So it's often good to look at the younger growth if you're opposite versus alternate. We'll do dogwood first. Dogwood is the third highest, third hardest tree on that list. Dogwood, as you probably know, doesn't get very big. It's a beautiful landscape tree. You probably recognize the flowers there on the left with the distinctive four petals. There are a number of imported dogwoods as well, some of which have pointed leaves, but again, the four petals. Those aren't really petals though, because they're not arranged on the flower in quite the right way. Those are bracts, much like the bracts that help the seeds flow the way in the basswood. They're bracts because they're not in the right place of the flower. Those are actually surrounding a number of small yellow flowers in the middle. Beautiful, whatever you want to call them. The leaves on all of the dogwoods that I know of, including the imported dogwoods, have characteristic veining. The veins are pinnate. They don't come out, all come out from a single point. They come out at multiple points along the central vein. But these, veins wrap around and they wrap parallel to the edge of the outer edge of the tree. So that's a distinctive trait of the dogwood. Not all of the dogwoods, but our dogwood, the American, the, well, the, the flowering dogwood, the one that is native to Ohio, has a distinct bark. It's kind of like cornflake looking, I guess, but smaller, more like lizard skin. They've got these small scales, maybe half an inch, half an inch, maybe up to an inch, across much lighter in color than the uh, cherry, but otherwise somewhat similar. They have these little garlic looking buds that point up in the winter. It's also a, a beautiful sight in the winter with especially with a little bit of snow on them. Very hard wood and uh, light in color. It was popular for candlesticks, wood turnings, etc. Was wouldn't probably be used for furniture or anything like that. They don't get real big, maybe eight inches in diameter is a pretty hefty one. Again, as beautiful as they are, who cares? I should warn you, I, I did warn you, I'll warn you again. There are exceptions to all of these rules. Doesn't Nature doesn't care about our classification schemes. This is opposite, but there is an alternate leaf, dogwood as well. I have only once or twice seen them in, a, uh, in an arboretum somewhere but you might find some that aren't opposite. All the ones I've seen except for one or two are opposite. But they're still dogwoods because they have the other traits. Again, that's opposite alternate leaf shape, that's secondary. <coughs> Excuse me, now we're going to, I'm going to discuss a leaf that is opposite, sort of. These leaves are what we call world, W-H-O-R-L-E-D. You see in the far right picture there, three leaves coming out at the same point on the stem. But instead of being directly across from each other, there are three. Some trees have more than three coming out at the same point. Apple, crab apple is an example. They have clusters of leaves coming out at one point. That's called world. Northern Catalpa and the Southern Catalpa for that matter has a little different leaf shape, but they usually come out in groups of three. The leaves are unmistakable. Those, the leaves are the size of your head and heart-shaped, much bigger than the uh, dog, than the, I'm sorry, the red bud leaves we saw earlier, but a similar heart shape. The twigs are very stout, even though it's a simple leaf. It's not a compound leaf, but the twigs are stout because the leaf is so big, even though it's not compound. You see the seed pods in the second picture from the left hanging onto the tree in the winter. It's a good winter identification trait. This one has more seed pods than most, but you'll usually find a few if you look a little bit. Again, you spot them from the freeway a lot of times. And you can see the seed pods there in the left picture together with the leaves. Over a foot long, the seed pods, a little bigger than a pencil in diameter, and they have a bunch of seeds in them, which puts them in the legume family. 
and you can identify the twigs in the winter by the three uh, three leaf scars all at the same point. So you can even identify it by twig. I don't consider the bark very distinctive. Maples, very important lumber species. Again, you probably recognize in general the maple leaf shape, if you know any trees at all. The Canadian flag is a sugar maple. And if you, I'm sure you know what that looks like. But that's not what makes a maple a maple. They don't all have leaves that shape. What makes a maple a maple, just as acorns make the oak, this paired Samara, left-right pairs that flutter down like helicopters, that makes the genus Acer, which is a group of maples. Canadian flag is, is fine, but the uh, penny is kind of funny because if you look at the penny here, the leaves, those are sugar maples and they did a nice job of drawing them, but they didn't put them opposite. They drew them alternate. There is nothing across from the, that leaf there. So that's a little bit curious. And if you look at the Canadian $5 bill, they didn't get that quite right either. They drew a Norway maple leaf, which is similar to the sugar maple, but not quite. So they have a tree that's not native to Canada on their $5 bill. So if you ever decide to, uh, if you ever commission to uh, design a penny or a coin or a stamp, I would highly recommend you get out the book and look at it closely. Sugar maple, very important lumber species. And of course, you know that this is where maple syrup comes from. Natives were doing it before the, uh, before the Europeans got here. Some people are under the impression that maple syrup is made of pure sap. It's not quite that easy. You have to tap the tree and take about 30, 35 gallons of sap and boil it down to get one gallon of maple syrup. And don't scorch it, you've wasted a lot of time and trouble. The leaves have the Canadian flag shape, but the sugar maple is distinctive because if you look at the sinus, the low spot in between the lobes, it is U-shaped. So you can remember that the U is in sugar. The U-shaped sinus tells you that this is a sugar maple. It's a good hard lumber, it makes good cutting boards and lots of other things, of course, pallets, furniture, a lot of furniture is made out of maple. Uh, Longerberger baskets, uh, that's another story, but they're made out of, typically made out of maple, but ash is a more popular choice for baskets typically. Um, very smooth. A lot of things, for example, a cutting board is often made of maple. Oak is hard enough, but oak is porous and would tend to retain flavors. Cutting boards, rolling pins, et cetera, you make them out of maple, they'll wash off and not retain much flavor. At the opposite extreme from the sugar maple is a silver maple. It's opposite in several ways. It's native, it loves water. Sugar maple doesn't like water so much. Silver maple does, often found along streams and rivers. It's also a popular street tree because it is, rot it is I'm sorry, pollution resistant. They grow fast. They grow to four or five feet in diameter if you leave them alone for a while. And they have a bark on the left there that looks kind of like the cat scratch tree, the, the Eastern hophorn bean, but the pattern is much larger. Those strips, instead of under half an inch wide, are maybe an inch stri wide strips of bark. And the tree is huge compared to a hophorn bean, feet in diameter instead of maybe a foot. The leaf is distinctive. It's got a very long lobe, very deep sinuses compared to the other maples. If you're good, you can tell them apart by the seeds too. I can kind of kind of sort of do that, but I'm not going to get into that level of detail. In between the oh the this the silver maple. I'll go back one here. Silver maple is a soft maple. Soft is relative. This is harder than a lot of the other hardwoods, but it isn't nearly as hard as a sugar maple. If you go to the lumber yard, they'll sell you maple as either soft maple or hard maple, but they probably wouldn't tell you which. This would be in the, in the soft maple stack. Also in the soft maple stack is red maple. It looks quite a bit like the sugar maple, but you can see that it does not have U-shaped sinuses. It's got V-shaped pointy sinuses and lots of little teeth. There isn't much red on the red maple. The red is in the stem. You can see the color there on the stem. And the flowers, again, that's something you put in a vase, but they spread and 
accept pollen and which they turn into the paired wafered seeds, the paired samaras. And they sometimes describe that as winged seeds. But the red flowers are beautiful in the spring for a couple of weeks. It'll give a, an otherwise bare tree a kind of a reddish glow, so very pretty. You can tap the red maple and even the silver maple for sugar, but you're gonna do a whole lot more boiling because the sap is a lot, uh, a lot more watery than the sugar maple. Norway maple, definitely not uh, native, but just for comparison, I kind of wanted to show you this because it looks enough like the sugar maple. You might well confuse it. The sinuses are even shallower than the sugar maple. And in many cases, but by no means all, they have red leaves. They're popular for landscaping because of the often reddish or purplish color and they're pollution tolerant. But I'm not a fan because they tend to get 40 or 50 euros, years old and then die. Maybe because of an infestation of something that they're not resistant to because they're not native. If you wanna know which one you've got, a Norway or a non-Norway, pull off the leaf and you'll see this white sap there, there on the right. The white sap tells you it's a Norway and not a native maple. The white sap has bitter stuff in it. It's not a tree you'd sap for, that you would tap for sugar. <laughs> okay, opposite pinnately compound. There aren't a whole lot. So we have tree, we have leaves and branches that stick out right across from each other. And these are compound leaves, they share a stem and the leaflets are not attached at the same point on the stem. And guess what? Box elder is still in the maple family. It doesn't follow the rules of the other. There are co other compound leafed maple trees, not native to Ohio, but you'll see them in landscaping. But the native Ohio buckeye, I'm sorry, the native Ohio I can't say those two words together without saying them together, Ohio Buckeye. The two, but the one native Ohio maple family member with compound leaves is the box elder. Box elder, remember I mentioned sassafras earlier, has green winter twigs. So does the box elder, but you can see they're obviously opposite here in front of my hand. Opposite in green is box elder. The leaves typically have three leaflets, but they can have five or seven. So it looks kind of like poison ivy, especially when it's smaller, but it gets a whole lot bigger. They can get several feet in diameter in a good sized tree of virtually no value for lumber because it's so soft. You don't want it next to your house because it may just collapse under its own weight. I leave them alone in my backyard because the native, the, the, the it's a native and the, uh, Animals seem to like it, so it's not hurting anything, but it's structurally weak, not very, not very good, not very popular. People don't very often deliberately plant them. You can see it has a lot of twigs coming off of the uh, trunk and it's got a light colored bark. So it's got a pretty distinctive winter traits there, but the opposite green twigs are the most distinctive trait. It does have one, now you can always make a pallet out of it, but it does have one nice trait that woodworkers like is that it occasionally gets a fungal infestation and the tree produces some kind of a scarlet chemical that appears in scarlet red streaks that combat the fungus. And so people making jewelry boxes and candlesticks and wood turnings will sometimes seek out this red streaky uh, box elder. So it is nice for that. It's got its own beauty. Okay, more Samaras, wafer seeds with a seed at the end, but they're not paired in left, right. Helicopters, they just kind of flutter down to the ground ungracefully. They're sometimes described as Samaras. The winged seeds are sometimes described as looking like a canoe paddle with a handle broken off. If you look down on this left picture, looking down on a sapling, you can see that those five leaves compound leaves with the leaflets attached to different point. Pinately compound, five leaflets each are coming at each other from right angles. So you've got one in the upper left, a leaf in the upper right, one in the lower right, one in the lower left. The winter twigs are very distinctive because they're stout and they're opposite. They look like pitchforks. 
and they even made pitchforks out of them when they got large enough sometimes. They would uh, take a nice fat stout one, cut it off, and they already had three of their tines of their pitchfork, and they might have added some in between. So those are ashes. You remember again, maple ash, I'm sorry, maple ash, dogwood, buckeye, the bad bucks, the opposite trees, but the three woods with the parallel grain and the ring porous structure are ash oak hickory. Ash is the softest of the three. You can see the characteristic ring porosity on that stump on the right. A lot of times you can see it just in the stump. You don't necessarily have to cut it with a saw or anything to see that. See that. Well, somebody cut it with a saw, but it doesn't have to be a real smooth cut necessarily. The ashes have this distinctly diamond looking bark on the left. You usually always tell it. And some people like to remember that baseball bats are typically made out of ash. Again, it's long. It's got a long grain. It's shock resistant, just right for a baseball bat. You could make a baseball bat out of hickory, but it would be awfully heavy. Babe Ruth used one, but not everybody's Babe Ruth. Ash was the traditional wood for baseball bats. And ash is a good choice for longer handled things like shovel handles and uh, rake handles typically were made of ash. It's got a long grain. You don't need the impact resistance of hickory like you would to make an ax. So you've got long grain and strength, flexible, as much shock resistance as you need, but no more. That would be too heavy, so that's ash. Unfortunately, as you know, ash is being attacked by the emerald ash borer. There's the hole one of the little critters made in the middle picture. They have a, a clear D-shaped hole. I don't know what the D-shape is for. I guess they go in, go in at any angle. I, when I first saw them, I thought it was going to look like a tunnel with a flat spot always in the bottom, but the orientation doesn't seem to make any difference, but they're D-shaped. The, they go in there, they burrow around under the bark. They call those galleries there on the left. You can see the galleries where the bark has come off and the, uh, the emerald ash borers were burrowing around. It cuts off the food supply. As you may know, the bark underneath the bark, the cambium, that's where the fluids and all the new growth is taking place just on top of the wood and underneath the bark. That living layer there, the active layer, is only a, a one or several cells thick. And if it gets eaten and burrowed into, it kills the tree. That's why it girdles, that's why it kills the tree, carving your name into it. You only have to go in through that bark a little ways to kill a tree. You see the downed trees there on the right. If you look close, you can see the diamond bark. It's just totally savaging the uh, ashes. They were uh, an unobjectionable tree, not a lot of rot resistance, but a beautiful furniture wood, et cetera, and didn't hurt anybody. It's all disappearing at once. To distinguish them, the three common ash trees in this part of Ohio, at least, you see the white ash on the left, the green ash, also used to be called the red ash. They decided that's one species. Green ash is a preferred term now. Green ash in the middle, blue ash on the right. You can tell them apart by their leaf scars and the buds. It, on the left is the white ash. White ash also, it's named for the fact that it's got a distinctly lighter color on the underside. I'll show you the leaves in a minute. But I like to tell them apart by the uh, buds. White ash has a light, much lighter under, light, underside on the leaf but it's also got this U-shaped scar. The bud comes down into the, into the leaf scar and makes a U-shape. If you flip it over in the backside, it's opposite. There's another bud, bud and leaf scar just behind it. You've got a double U, double U as in white ash. The green ash looks more like a D-shape or a shield shape with the bud sitting up on top of it. The blue ash is distinct because it's got these four ridges running along the ends of the twigs toward the bud. The bud looks toward the terminal bud. The side buds, the lateral buds, look a fair amount like the other two ashes, but these distinct wings or ridges, four ridges running out to the bud, uh, make it obvious that it's a blue ash. And it even gives it the Latin name of a, a, a Fraxinus is ash, Fraxinus quadrilangulata. So it's got four sides on the twigs. They're all lumber species. 
I didn't show you the leaves, I guess. They're compound, they look, they're pinnately compound, rather plain looking, um, not terribly distinctive, but uh, the bark usually gives them away if you can find any healthy ones. In fact, unfortunately, if you find a large tree and it's got leaves on it, it's probably not an ash, very unfortunate. Opposite palmately compound, you should know this tree, Buckeyes. Good example of how you can pick out compound leaf trees because the leaflets just occur in characteristic numbers. The two native Ohio tree-sized buckeyes uh, are the yellow buckeye and the Ohio buckeye, and they have five leaflets like you see on the left. It's coincidental that you have five leaves there, but they, they all have five leaflets. Good-sized leaflets, uh, maybe six, eight inches long, sometimes a little longer. The bark is light in color. It doesn't have furrows, but it's kind of rough. It looks to me like a cigar ash. You can see the buds there and the twig in the middle. They have uh, maybe not quite obvious in the picture, but they have distinct visible scales. And you can see those two lower lateral buds are directly across from each other. Buckeye seems to lose a lot of its twigs and a couple of them will continue and one won't. So when I'm looking for opposites, I'm sometimes thrown off by the uh, twigs on the buckeye, but the buds will give it away. And after you've seen enough of them, the bark becomes distinctive. Leaves are obvious in the summer. I'll just throw in one other, I guess the 51st tree is the horse chestnut. Some people seem to think that horse chestnut is not a buckeye, like it's a pretty different group, but in fact, they've got the same, they're in the same genus. So except for the species level, they're the same as the Ohio buckeyes, but they, they're not native to Ohio. The horse chestnuts are, they have the same buckeye looking fruit, but they're native to Europe and Asia. They are distinctive because they have pink flowers in the spring. They have these clusters of flowers growing in the end of panicles. Those stalks that they're growing on are called panicles. The Ohio and the yellow buckeyes on the right have mostly greenish, greenish and then later whitish ivory colored uh, flowers. You'll see pink or sometimes even dark red on the horse chestnuts, but they have the same general pattern of the palmate compound leaves. Some of them have five leaflets, some have more than five leaflets. The two Ohio native tree size buckeyes you can tell apart by, well, you can tell apart by looking at the leaf scar, but a more obvious way to recognize them is because bumpy Brutus. The one on the left is an Ohio buckeye. Brutus is not a yellow, Brutus is an Ohio buckeye. Bumpy Brutus buckeye on the left, the smooth yellow buckeye on the right. Some people tell a difference also by rubbing the leaf. The leaf of the Ohio buckeye has a kind of bad odor. It's also called the fetid buckeye because it's, or even the stinking buckeye. I think that's a name somebody in Michigan made up, but I call it the Ohio buckeye, proudly so. Buckeye is not much of a lumber species. In fact, the one of those several softest hardwoods in Ohio is the yellow buckeye. The Ohio buckeye is almost twice as hard, but still not very hard. And they were, because of they were lightweight back before we had a lot of plastics, Human limbs, artificial limbs were often made out of buckeye because they weren't very hard, but they were hard enough and they weren't, they didn't have half the weight you would have in something like a hickory wooden leg or wooden arm or what have you. So they did have some uses there. They're again used for pallets or whatever. And you know, you never know when you're buying so-called hardwood furniture. It doesn't necessarily mean it's hard hardwood. It might even be made out of buckeye if you don't know, but that probably wouldn't be the first thing they'd make it out of unless they were unless they were pretty shady characters. No pun intended, sorry. <laughs> we're to the last of the 50 trees. Opposite palmately compound. Here you see the leaflets in groups of three, very much like the hop horn beam. But if you look close and there are no fruits on it, you see that the leaves are attached directly across from each other. This is opposite tree leaflets, the common hop trees, alternate tree leaflets. Has a distinctive fruit, they're, they're coming on right now. These are winter fruits on the right. They look like little Japanese lanterns. 
They'll hold on into the winter, makes them identifiable, but they're in fruit right now. It's, it's a good time to look at them. If you want a good place to see a lot of bladder nuts right now, I would go to High Banks, go down to the river walk, and along the middle of the trail, there's gobs of them. They're not at all a big tree. They're not even as big as the hop tree. I don't think they get, I saw one the other day at High Banks, maybe 20 feet high, but they're not a big tree by any means. I'm not aware of any commercial use. They might have had some additional use, but it's a little sort of inflated looking bladder with these little seeds in them. And uh, that's the American bladder now. So that is 50 Ohio trees in a nutshell, admittedly a coconut. I'll be happy to take any questions.